I'm super excited to have him come speak. Um, he, uh, his background is, uh, he's, right now he's a partner at Google Ventures, but before that, like I said, he was in product management, a group product management at Google. Um, and he got there via acquisition of Jotspot, which became Google Sheets, right? Is it? Sites. Sites. Your site, sorry, Google Sheets, Sites, who's VP of products there. His talk is 10x, not, I just love the title of the talk, 10x, not 10%. It's like dream big, like don't do something small. Uh, Moonshot Product Management. His, you should definitely check out his blog, uh, KenNorton.com. He has a very famous article from a while ago, back in the days when it was like there wasn't a lot of product management advice and guidance out there. He wrote an excellent post called How to Hire a Product Manager that people still link to and reference all the time today. And um, I've been to his talks before, and he's just a super smart guy and, a, and an awesome speaker, so I think you'll really enjoy it. So with that, I'd love to welcome Ken Norton up here. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I decided that when I saw that Dan used PowerPoint. So I, how, well that, how well that worked. Uh, it's adorable. Though. Thank you. Sir. Um, so I also need to make sure I can see my speaker notes. Is, Is the volume okay God. in the back, guys? Can you hear, can you hear me? A little louder. Right, a little louder? Okay. Uh, I have a lot of facts, so that's why I need to be able to see my speaker notes. And, uh, I've learned that. Uh, even if you're making up your facts, if it looks like you're looking at speaker notes, people are more inclined to do so, <laughs> uh, this. I'm just going to be like referring to this. Who remembers these? Yeah, all right. Who doesn't remember these? <laughs> all right, yeah, if you remember, if you don't remember these, you're probably under a certain age. <laughs> if you remember these, you're probably over a certain age. Uh, if you still use these, you're probably over <laughs> even higher. If you, if you have one in your pocket and it contains your dentures, then maybe you're even over even a higher age. But these are film canisters. Uh, it's, it's fun to think about technology and how much things have advanced by looking at the artifacts that are created. And, and I uncovered one of these uh, a few months ago when I was cleaning out my garage, and it reminded me how incredibly useful they were. I mean, these were, I, I forget about film. Like film canners, you can store anything in these things. And they're bulletproof, they're waterproof, they're great. Quarters. But quarters, uh, anything, your weed, I don't know. Um, but the reason I want to talk about this is, is not to talk about weed, although probably be more entertaining, fewer facts. Uh, I do want to talk about the history of photography. Um, this is the Kodak Brownie camera. Uh, there were many, many models. This is the, Coney, uh, the Kodak Brownie Flash 4. Uh, it was made in 1957. I told you I had facts. Uh, this was made in England. Uh, Kodak sold millions and millions of these Brownie cameras. You may have had one when you were a kid. You may have seen one. Uh, it's an in incredible dominance of an industry uh, film cameras that in many ways is, is all but gone. Uh, this was film. So Kodak made money on cameras, but they made even more money on film. Uh, this is the ultimate kind of Gillette uh, razor business model. Uh, at one point, Americans alone were buying a billion rolls of film, a billion rolls. And Kodak had 80% plus profit margins on film. It was incredible. I and mean, you think about how much money they were making on this stuff. Uh, they dominated the market for a long time. This company, Kodak, was, was really there uh, kind of recording our lives over their backyard. Barbecues, weddings. The space program, as I'll show you, Kodak was, was really kind of everywhere. Um, and I started to research Kodak because I read an article where they were described as the Google of their day. And they were founded in, I think, the late 1800s. They were really known for innovation. I started reading up on them. They, they had what is essentially kind of similar to Google's 20% project. They, had, so they let scientists and researchers work on their own stuff. They had 60,000 employees at their peak, which is about what Google has today. Uh, and, and it kind of made me think, you know, how much this company that once dominated our life uh, is similar to a company that I've worked for for a long time. And, and, and how did they go from where they were to where they are now, um, which is largely forgotten. But for, for a period of time, it's worth remembering, Kodak was, was pretty dominant. Um, to see how dominant they were, I, I went and looked at uh, historical film camera sales. It might be hard to see in the back. But these, are, these are film camera sales. The start of this graph is 1977. It goes to 19, 1996. Uh, at the start of this graph, they already had 90% of the film sales in the US and something like 85% of the camera sales. And they basically dominated this. That's the beginning of the graph. And it's kind of kept going up. Um, but there's, you're probably wondering why the right side of the graph is, is blacked out. 
Uh, and that's for a good reason, which is within basically a decade, I mean, if you look at 1997 to 2007, uh, the, the film camera in the industry essentially collapsed, disappeared. Um, by, by 2012, the company was in bankruptcy. They spun out a, chem a chemical company, and they essentially were uh, just a pile of patents. And, and 50,000 jobs were lost. And a lot of these jobs were lost in Western Europe, near where I grew up. And I knew a lot of people, friends of my parents, uh, who worked for Kodak. So this, you know, what happened, right? I mean, let's, I mean, if you were in 1997, you knew nothing about the rest of the world, you knew nothing about external conditions, which we talk about, you think you're, you're riding high, right? I mean, that was a great business. Uh, well, to explain what happened, I'm going to have to crunch the graph down a little bit. And what happened was digital, digital cameras. Uh, now, this was a, a technological shift that happened pretty suddenly. I, mean, I think there's, you know, from 1998 to 2008, digital cameras essentially just completely evaporated the film camera industry. Uh, but this wasn't a, 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 you know, this is a technological shift, but, but Kodak had proven that they were capable of doing that before. So if you want to say, okay, well, it's innovator's dilemma, they were caught off guard, they didn't predict it. And actually, they'd done this before. They moved from dry plate to film, they'd moved from black and white to color, which is a, a really interesting kind of innovator's dilemma uh, experience because color photography, when it came out, was nowhere near the quality of black and white, and they were able to dominate that market. Um, but as we know, this isn't even the end of the story because digital cameras have proved to be pretty short-lived, certainly standalone digital cameras, um, and they would be replaced by <laughs> all the cameras that are in your pocket right now, uh, smartphones. We're going to sell a billion and a half smartphones around the world uh, this year, a billion and a half. Is there anybody who does not have a camera in your pocket right now? <laughs> all right, I mean, think about 10 years ago if I'd asked that question. I mean, maybe half of you would have had, you know, a, 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 a a phone with a camera on it, or maybe a standalone digital camera. If I'd asked that question 20 years ago, there would have been a couple people in the back who were professional photographers, and that would have been it. So photography cameras, uh, you know, within a, a very short period of time are essentially everywhere. Um, that's 40 times the number of cameras that, film cameras that were sold in the very best year of Kodak. So 40 times the number, just this year alone, around the world. Uh, people around the world are going to take a trillion photos this year, and I, I wasn't quite sure how big a trillion was. It doesn't seem that big because, you know, the federal government spends trillions and trillions. It doesn't seem like a lot of money. But that's 2.7 billion photos a day, right, of the, what, 7, 8 billion people around the world? 2.7 billion photos a day. And 80% of those are being taken on our smartphones, our mobile phones. Okay, so back to Kodak. What happened to Kodak? They must have been caught off guard. They didn't predict digital. They were too buried in film, they didn't even realize that it was coming. Um, not really. This is the very first digital camera ever created uh, in 1975. It uses a cassette tape for storage. Um, those of you who remember cassette tape far predate film cancers. Um, they, it was invented at Kodak. It's Kodak. Kodak invented the digital camera in 1975, the very first digital camera. They were selling consumer digital cameras as early as 1991. Well, I think my first standalone digital camera was a, was a Kodak digital camera. So this wasn't a company that was taken by surprise. This wasn't a company that, that didn't anticipate digital. I mean, clearly, they, they invented it. This is a guy named Stephen Sasson. He is the engineer at Kodak who invented the digital camera. It started as a uh, lab project. Uh, I read an interesting interview with him where he said the first time he gave the demo of the digital camera to a bunch of executives, he got a lot of kind of head nods, and then someone afterwards took him aside and said, that's cute, don't tell anyone about it. <laughs> and as he said, that every digital camera that Kodak envisioned selling, or envisioned being sold, uh, took away from a film camera. And, and more importantly, took away from film that would then be sold to that film camera. And they knew how much money they were making on film. And as Stephen has now said, he's done a lot of interviews, uh, he, he, he was unable to convince him that the problem is that someday you're not going to be able to sell film. Uh, because this is the way the, the world is going. As late as, I think, 2006, the CEO of Kodak uh, still was describing digital as a crappy business. 2006, right? I, mean, I was already working at Google in 2006. It's ridiculous. Um, so here is a case study. And the reason I start with this is because it's worth diving into. A case study of Kodak who where their engineers invented the future, and their executives, or their, their organization, something, uh, squandered it. 
So this isn't the classic example of a company that wasn't able to predict technology or was taken off guard or wasn't technical. This is a company that effectively invented it and lost it. So why was that? Okay, so why were Kodak executives so fearful of digital? Uh, there's a psychological term called loss aversion, probably a lot of you are familiar with. And it's, it's actually pretty fascinating. It, it basically tells us that losing hurts more than winning feels good. So almost, I think, effectively two to one. So winning $100 uh, you know, is, is about as uh, you know, enjoyable uh, to compensate for losing $200. Right, so, or, or sorry, losing $100 is as enjoyable as winning, I don't know, something like that, two to one. <laughs> um, this, is, this is what I first, oh yeah, two to one. I see that there on my speaker notes. Uh, but, but you get the impression, right? I mean, you know, losing 100 bucks, like if you lost 100 bucks, it was in your jacket, you'd be like, ah, oh, $100, like that's horrible. And then, you know, you win $200, you'd be like, that's cool. But they really balance each other out because we have this psychological um, predisposition to not wanting to lose something that we have. And it's why we, continue to gamble uh, you know, in Vegas, right? You see, you lose money, you keep putting more money after it because you want to win it back. Uh, it's why people tend to ride stocks as they go down and down and down. So there's a psychological aspect to us that does not, that does not like losing something that we already have. In fact, we, we're more protective of losing something than we are willing to gain something new. So not surprisingly, companies are made up of people. People have loss aversion. Companies have, have loss aversion. So Kodak has this. Uh, and I want to prove this out by doing a little, little uh, experiment here. And I want you to pretend at your company that you're confronted with two possible projects that you can pick. And let's assume that they take the same number of people and the same amount of time. And bear with me, this is pretty fictional. But let's assume that on the left side there's a project that you're pretty certain, nothing's 100% certain, but you're pretty certain is going to get you a million dollars to the bottom line company. You know, you know how it's going to get done. Everybody feels pretty confident in it. And there's another one that is just like wild ass, crazy project that, you know, if it succeeds, <laughs> could be worth a billion dollars, but you're only really giving it a 1% chance. It's kind of really a moonshot, a big, a big chance. Um, which one would you pick? I know a lot of companies I've I know a lot of people I've asked this question to. You pick the one on the left. I mean, you pick the one on the left if you want to have a career, if you want to get promoted, if you want to get recognition. <laughs> Uh, it, it's the bird in the hand, right? A million dollars, right? You know how much that, that costs. What, another one on the right is some pretty good chance it's going to fail, and then you're left with nothing. But if you do expect the value, to, those of you who study decision science, um, you know, the decision science tells us actually the expected value of the one on the right is effectively 10 times more than the one on the left, right? You, even given the, the low likelihood that it'll succeed. Uh, and even knowing that, we still are just like, ah, oh, that seems like a mistake. Um, and Things are never this cut and dry. You're never presented with two projects side by side that are equal. But that almost proves the point more, because even when you are, it's still hard to pick the one that we know is worth 10 times than the one uh, on the left. And the point I want to make tonight is that Kodak was a 10% company, meaning they were happily moving forward increasing their market, increasing their market share, increasing their revenue by 10%, when what they really needed to be was a 10x company. And so 10x order of magnitude, uh, it's a moonshot, right? A big, big swing um, that you know, may be unlikely to succeed, but will have massive, massive payoffs when it does. Um, and the thing is, is that if you're only going for 10%, you're taking the path that everyone else is on. Fuji, every other camera company was marching forward down the same path with existing technology, doing things you know, a little faster, a little better, a little bigger, a little bit more market share. But if you want to do something 10x, you have to throw out everything that's been done before. You have to think completely differently. Like you can't do it the way you were doing it before. If I, I can build a car probably that gets 50 miles <coughs> a gallon using all the technology that we have today, a little bit better, a little bit more accurate. But if I set out to build a car that gets 5,000 miles to the gallon, it's pretty clear you have to throw everything out and start over and think about the problem in a completely new and different way. And so if you imagine that meeting with Kodak, with Steven Sasson, if instead of worrying about what that product might do to their existing revenue stream around film, if somebody had said, 
Americans are buying a billion rolls of film a year. What, what would it take to get people to take a trillion photos a year? I mean, where we are today. What if we were selling a, bill, a billion and a half cameras a year? Like, it's pretty clear that it wasn't going to be film. Where would we put all the film canisters? I mean, there's just no, I mean, the, the production, the, like, the printing, like, a bit, yeah, yeah, that's, that's insane. Like, it was obvious that that was not going to get done via film. Now, there's lots of these examples of, of you know, what we call at Google 10x thinking. Uh, I'll give you one example from history. This is a, a, a mechanical Swiss, Swiss mechanical watch. Uh, so for a long time, I don't know, maybe a century or more, Swiss watchmakers would compete with each other to make their their watches more accurate, more miniature, you know, cooler, more interesting, smaller, uh, and it was it was a lot of work. And every now and then there'd be a, a, a leap, and it would be measured in percentages. There was a one I think watch that came out that was a 25 percent improvement in accuracy, and that was you know massive. Uh, that was huge, huge amount of work and effort. Um, but competing was pretty exhausting, right? I mean, you had craftsmanship and, you know, those lenses and, you know, just making tooling and just making stuff smaller and smaller and smaller. And every single Swiss watchmaker was doing the same thing, right? I mean, you're all trying to eke out a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, 10% improvement here and there, 10% cost. But if you'd said, what if we wanted to make a watch that was 10 times more accurate than a mechanical watch, it's pretty clear that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have kept doing what you were doing. You would have probably done something like this. This is the very first, or one of the very first uh, quartz, uh, dig digital quartz movement watches. Um, and it is 10 times more accurate, more than 10 times more accurate than the best mechanical watch for 10% cost. I mean, huge, huge leap. Uh, and, and the Japanese were really the first ones to, to, to bring this to market, and it pretty much obliterated the mechanical watch market. They, they actually call it the Swiss quartz crisis, if you read up on it. I mean, it, within a space of a few years, it, like, all the Swiss watchmakers were basically you know, on the ground trying to figure out how to survive. Uh, and it's why today you could go buy a $10 Casio watch that's way more accurate than the $20,000 Rolex. Right? Um, you because know, if you're buying a $20,000 Rolex, it's not because you need to know what time it is. Right? It's a piece of jewelry. right? It's not, you know, if you want to know what time it is, you can do that much more cheaply. Um, and so the example here is that the Swiss, and you're not going to be surprised when I tell you this after the story of Kodak, Swiss actually were the first ones to get quartz movement out. There's actually a, 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 an engineer at a Swiss watchmaker was the first one to kind of get a working miniaturized uh, quartz movement watch going. Um, but, you know, this, the Swiss watchmakers, they were, were unable to commit, they were afraid of it, they you know, long come, uh, you know, long come Seiko and, and pretty much close the market away. Um, but this is a, t a 10x improvement, and we're seeing it again. I mean, it's pretty rare to even be wearing a watch on your wrist. I mean, it's probably your, your your mobile phone now, or maybe Apple watches. So we're seeing that that generation shift <laughs> again. Now, the interesting thing when you look at that quartz to mechanical example is, and I've, and I've I've researched this, I've asked people this. It really wasn't that much harder to make the first quartz electronic movement watch than it was to try to get another 10% out of mechanical watches. Because getting 10% more was, was incredibly costly. It was like an asymptotic. I mean, it just got harder and harder and harder to get smaller and smaller, and the machining got more expensive. And I don't want to diminish how much work it was to get quartz movement going. And certainly it depended on you know, microprocessors and there was a lot. But you could actually make an argument that it wasn't that much harder. It certainly wasn't 10 times harder. And Gentleman I work with at Google named Astro Teller. Uh, he is uh, head of, of Google X. Actually, the only thing cooler than Astro Teller's name <laughs> is his title, <laughs> Captain of Moonshots. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the point he makes is, you know, actually sometimes it's easier to do something 10x better than it is to do it 10% better. Because the way you're doing it when you're doing it 10% better is you're using existing technologies, you're using existing costs, you're competing for the same talent, it's costing the same amount, everyone's doing it, you're marching forward. 10x requires a completely different way of thinking about something. Uh, and it may actually turn out that when you start to lean on bravery and creativity and new ways of solving problems, that it could actually be easier if you're just forced to think about it in a different way. And so this is about the point when I, when I do this talk for audiences where people say, okay, that's really great, 
if you work for Google, or if you work for SpaceX, I work for a startup, I work for a small company, like I, you just you can't afford to just go off and into the attic and spend several months trying for this 1%, uh, $1 billion project. And what I find is fascinating is that's actually what big companies say too. If you go to big companies, they say, oh, this sounds like it's great for startups, but we're a big company, we've got revenues, we've got customers, we can't take these kinds of chances. Like, it sounds great if you're a startup, what's that happen if you go to business? And the point I want to make is that it actually has nothing to do with your company, with your industry, with the technology you're working on. It's a different way of thinking about how you solve problems. Uh, and it's just as useful for small companies as it is for big companies. It doesn't even matter what industry it is, as I'll show you later. It has nothing to do with even whether you're working on technology. It's just a different mindset for approaching problem solving. Um, and the, the first thing you need to do, so we talk about, okay, well, what, do, what should I do? How do I, how do I make this happen? Uh, the first thing that's super, super important is how you think about failing. Astro uh, tells a story, or you know, uses an illustration of, imagine a bunch of explorers are exploring a new continent, and they send out a bunch of scouts. And they say, go find a mountain. And the scouts come back several months later, and say they didn't find a mountain. Well, if you shame them, right, if you punish them for not finding a mountain, that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, what, like, what do you expect? Right? They didn't find a mountain. Uh, they're certainly not going to go out on another mission if you shame them or humiliate them for not finding the mountain. And thinking about how you create new things is very similar. You don't know what you're going to find until you get there. And the other important part of that is, even if you fail when you're trying something incredibly ambitious, sometimes you still accomplish something that's big and is important. I mean, maybe they didn't find a mountain, but maybe they found a village, or maybe they found a water source, or maybe they found some, some livestock. Uh, because when you're trying something ambitious, chances are even when you fail, you still might have accomplished something that's useful. You still might have accomplished something that's important. And even if you didn't, failure is how we learn. And learning is how you improve. And trying requires failure. Trying requires making mistakes, learning something new, <coughs> trying it again, and moving forward. And to illustrate this, I'm going to take an example from, from the art world. There's uh, two artists named uh, Ted Orland and David Whalen who wrote a book uh, about, it's called Art and Fear, it's kind of like the philosophy of, of art. And they tell a story in that book about a ceramics teacher who's been teaching ceramics for a long time and found herself with a class that was split across two different days. So, you know, upcoming semester, one class was meeting on Tuesday, one class was meeting on Thursday, and she's like, huh, I'm trying an A-B experiment. I'm going to try something new. So for the first class, she says the same thing to them that she's been saying to students for, I don't know, 20 years. And that is that you're going to be graded based on the quality of your work. So you have a semester to learn how to make great pots. At the end of the semester, you're going to turn in the very best pot that you created, and you're going to get great. Right? The better it is, the better your grade's going to be. Pretty simple. That's how she's been doing it. The other half of the class, you want to try something a little different. So the other half of the class, she said, you're going to be graded purely based on quantity. So your job this semester is to just crank out pots. You know, if you make 100 pots, you get an A. If you make 75, you get a B. You know, you can see where this is going, right? Um, something she'd never tried before. And what she found at the end of the semester was something pretty interesting, and that is that the very best work across the board, the highest technical ability, the most artistic, the best, highest quality pots were delivered not by the class that was asked to make the best pot, but by the ones that were asked to do the most pots. And there's a reason for that. They were just cranking out pots, right? They're just making pots left and right. They're learning. Like every single pot they're creating, they're learning something new, and they're getting better and better and better at their craft. Meanwhile, all these other suckers are trying to create the perfect, you know, they're spending, you know, like trying the entire semester trying to create the perfect pot. And the other guys, they were experimenting and learning, experimenting and learning, experimenting and learning. And so they didn't set out to create the best, but they did. And there's a quote from this that I love, which is, what you need to know about the next piece is contained in the last piece. So the more last pieces there are, the more you know about the next piece. So the more you screw up, the more you try and fail, the more you've learned about what doesn't work. The more you learn about what does work and the better you get. I mean, that's how we learn any craft. I mean, that's how you learn 
Think about all the things you've learned. You've learned by screwing up and trying it and figuring out a different way and learning and learning and learning. So why don't we build products that way? It's not how we build products. We don't build products that way for the most part. So let's think about how would you build a company that thinks 10x. <coughs> Mostly I saw a lot of product manager hands up, people in product related entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of people that are in a position to, to you know, influence, not necessarily decide, uh, influence the direction of your company and the products that you're building. So what, what would you do? How would you do things differently knowing what we know? And this is probably pretty intuitive. I hear, see a lot of heads nodding, so I don't think I'm saying anything that's blowing your mind yet. Yeah, may blow your mind. First thing is you need to recognize that the people that you hire, the people you work with, they want to do great work. Okay? So they want to do amazing things. And when they make a mistake, it's because they had good intentions, right? People aren't intentionally making mistakes. Right? So, you know, this sounds like a platitude, but if you think about how companies are organized, they're not really organized with this assumption in mind. And a lot of companies are organized to prevent people from screwing up, to penalize people for making mistakes, to reward people for not making mistakes. So you know, your first assumption, this goes back to being willing to accept failure, is recognize people want to do good stuff, right? I mean, people are wanting, they want, you hire them for a reason. They, they want to do their best work. There's a social psychologist named Doug, Douglas McGregor in the 60s at MIT who uh, actually kind of put this forward. He, he calls it theory X versus theory Y. Have you heard theory X versus theory Y? Okay, a couple, couple of hands. Theory X is the old way of doing management which is, you know, people are naturally lazy, they're self-centered, if you're not looking at them, they're going to slack off, they don't have any ambition, they resist change, and your job as a manager is to make sure that they do their work. I worked in restaurants when I was in college. If any of you ever worked in retail, you've probably experienced theory X management. That's the old way of, of doing things. Uh, theory Y, now this is in the 60s, was, was actually pretty <coughs> revolutionary. It was the opposite. It was this notion that Work comes as natural to us as play, and that we actually get a lot of satisfaction from doing great things, and that we have boundless imagination, and we're creative, and we want to do great work, and when people screw up, it's because they were trying hard, right? So we're all in Silicon Valley. I mean, it kind of feels like the, the foundation of theory why, but when you think about how companies are organized, how people are rewarded, how people are promoted, you know, how how work is is rewarded? Uh, it doesn't really fall in line with that, right? I mean, it's, you think about layers of management as companies get bigger. Basically, exist to make sure the people below them aren't messing up, and to kind of keep an eye on on ensuring they don't screw up, and to scold them when they do, and to get everybody in line. And this is lots of companies are built this way. So we don't put that into practice. We don't really we don't really put this into practice as much as we say this. Um, and then the the implication from that is that companies are much more effective at protecting against their downside than they are creating upside. Kodak, over years, built this insulation, this apparatus for making sure they didn't make a mistake or lose something. I mean, that was what Kodak had become, this behemoth that was going to make sure they weren't going to, they weren't going to, they weren't going to lose a single possible sale of film. Like that's what they had become. But they weren't very good about taking opportunities, taking risks, and creating, creating new upside. <clears throat> so this is the flip side of this. This is, okay, if people want to do great work, if they have good intentions in mind, well, naturally, they're going to do their best on stuff that they're interested in, problems that you know, really appeal to them. And that means you have to give people mobility. So you have to allow people to move to projects that are more interesting to them than the ones they might be working on. Um, you have to allow them to speak up if they may have an opinion about something that's not necessarily their job. A lot of companies are just like, you're not, you're not very welcome to weigh in on something that's not your job. I, mean, I don't think that Kodak had a weekly all-hands meeting where somebody who is you know, in the chemical plant and said, you know, I think we're losing out on this opportunity for digital. I think we really need to take better you know, that, that wouldn't happen. It, it, it was not their job. And they probably weren't, their, their opinion probably wasn't welcome. Uh, you know, this is where Google's 20% time comes from, and, and 3M before that, and Kodak, uh, you know, had something similar. I mean, this is this this notion that 
if you give people the opportunity to work on problems that are really fascinating to them, that are interesting to them, then great work might come from it. And if, even if great work doesn't come from it, at least a point of view of someone who's passionate about the problem could be useful. The other side of this is you need to have transparency. So I need to know everything that's going on in my company. If I'm going to gravitate to the problems that are interesting to me, if I'm going to share opinions, uh, if I'm going to weigh in on possible solutions and 10x things. So you have to default to open. Uh, and this is, you know, I know startups start this way, but it's, it's, I work with lots and lots of startups, and it's interesting to watch the point at which they start to become less transparent. So you're like, well, you know, we, we, we can't even we really worry about leaks. We can only share certain things with certain people. We've got to be careful. Well, we don't want to distract people with all this other stuff that's going on. The day I started at Google, I was blown away to find out that I could see everything, every paper that had been written, every line of code, every wiki. I was just like, I thought they were going to like, like turn off. Like, it was a mistake. I was like, trying to read everything without getting in trouble. But no, that's just the way Google is, right? I mean, they, they have this attitude toward being very secretive to the outside world. But if you're at Google, you deserve to know what other people are working on. Because maybe there's someone who's solving a problem that is useful to the problem you're working on. How would you know that if there wasn't transparency? Uh, maybe there's a project that's perfect for your interests and perfect for what you're passionate about. How would you know that otherwise? <coughs> But there's another side to this too, and it goes back to speaking up, and that's that if you don't give people visibility into what's going on, you don't give them opportunities to challenge what they don't like or what they think is, uh, is, is not truly taking advantage of opportunities. Uh, you know, if, if someone on another team doesn't know that we're not taking advantage of a technology that could be exciting or an opportunity that they think exists that they know something about, they're not in a position to really speak up and say, hey, we're missing out here. And so you have to have transparency. So what does this mean for PMs? You're not the CEO, most of you, probably not the CEO. Uh, what can you do? I mean, you can't, you know, it depends on your company, it depends on your culture, it depends on your company. probably limited influence that you have. So the first thing, is as a PM, use data, not opinions. And this is, this is sometimes hard to internalize as a PM because you think you're hired because you have these just tremendous instincts and you're just like, I just know this is going to work. I know this is going to. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, no, you don't. You certainly don't have better instincts than data. Uh, Jim Barksdale, who was the CEO of Netscape back in the day, had this famous quote where. You know, he was meeting with some team, he said, um, if you have facts, we'll use them. If all we have opinions, we're going to use mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I've seen this now, being a company that's incredibly data-driven, is there's something really exciting that happens when you start making decisions based on data. Is you start to move a lot faster. Right? Remember times at companies where, you know, we could argue for months over whether we thought, you know, <clears throat> this button was better than that button and never resolve it, or you can just test it, right? Throw it up, like, what, does it work or does it not work? Cut through the bullshit, right? <coughs> Find out if it works. If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't, don't. Uh, because when you become this kind of seeker of truth versus intuition, you start to, you know, you start, everybody starts to kind of point in the right direction. Because you're, you know, you're entitled to your own opinions, you're not entitled to your own facts. It's hard to confront facts. It's hard to confront data. Um, and it's your way to basically test if something is truly working. So this, in this 10x world, you know, the, the, back to the example of the scouts, you know, going a mile, seeing what's out there, coming back, refueling, going back two miles, you know, that type of iteration, that type of experimentation. The other thing that data does, particularly for larger companies where there are you know, layers of management or senior management, is it allows you to confront opposition. Because the worst thing for 10x thinking is somebody saying that will never work and it just never being tried and the pocket veto and it's done, right? Oh, that'll never work. Okay, move on. This is your way to say it, it is going to work. Let me show you the early findings. We've tested that. We've, we've experimented. We, we've got it working. It's, you know, it's all cobbled together and it's made out of bailing wax. And, but and like, look at it. It's working. We should do this. This is an opportunity for us. Um, this is especially important for PMs. What do we do day in and day out as PMs? 
how many bugs are in the queue, how many more pieces of code need to be written, how many more days do we have till we launch, you know, what's in the burn down chart, how many engineering get it. We're measuring effort all day long, that's what we do, right? That's effort, that's not impact. What you want to do is you me measure the impact you want to have. So when, when JFK challenged NASA to land on the moon, he said, we're gonna land on the moon. He didn't say, let's launch 20 rockets. We made a 25 stretch goal. No, he said, we're gonna land on the moon. Like the, the, the impact is we're gonna stand on the moon and we're gonna know when we got there, like make it happen. And so when you're a PM, it's really important that the goals you set, that the things you're measuring are on the impact you wanna have, not the effort. And here's another reason for that is if you're setting out a project plan, a project path, and you know exactly what you need to do to get there in six months or three months or a year, by definition, it's not 10x, right? Because you, you, know, you know everything needs to happen. And if you know what needs to happen, then it's not something new and innovative and creative. It's, it's just the, the same old well-worn path. Um, so you need to pivot toward thinking about what impact you want to have and measuring that. And the work that goes into making that happen, certainly that needs to be measured, but when, you're, when your mental focus as a PM is all directed on effort, it's going to be hard to, to step out of this 10% rule. The thing I want you to do is be bothered by limitations. Uh, you know, I've done this, you, you, you have these external limitations, you're like, oh, the browser's not fast enough, you know, the, that's not supported by that version of this, or like the you know, bandwidth isn't that high enough, not enough memory, there's all these like external limitations that we bump into, and we kind of bounce off them and we, we compensate for them. Because we just were like, that's, that's not my world, that's something else out there that is a barrier, right? I, not that I can do about that. To give you an example from Google, I think something like two thirds of the world still doesn't have reliable internet access. So I think, you know, it, it could be very easy to just say, <coughs> what do we, you know, we don't have anything to do with that, hope it gets better, but that's not how people like Google think, and instead a group of scientists and engineers are trying to bring internet access to the world through weather balloons, right? It's kind of ridiculous, but, but the point isn't whether that's gonna work or not. The point is that they weren't happy, they weren't satisfied when they bumped into a limitation. So how do we go around that? How do we compensate that? How can we, how can we make up for that? Uh, here's another example from the late 60s. So the container revolution, if you're, if you're interested in this, it's pretty really fascinating actually. Um, pretty quickly, standardized containers and faster container ships pretty much changed world shipping. Um, so if you were trying to ship something from Hawaii to San Francisco, now it took only a few days, whereas before maybe it took, you know, even up to a month just to load the ship and unload it and get there. Uh, but there's an interesting thing that, that happened when, when, that, when that started working is the ship would get to San Francisco and it would sit in port and wait for the bill of lading to arrive by U.S. mail. <laughs> from Hawaii, which then somebody would pick up and a customs officer would make their way around and then you could unload it. So it was kind of ridiculous, right? You had all this great, even they just sat in port or sometimes off port. Um, so I think it could have been very easy to say, US mail, like government, what's, you know, what's, what's more immovable than you know, a government regulatory agency? Um, but a group of people, pretty creative people on, on the island of Hawaii, they said, ah, oh, here's an interesting idea. What if, while you're loading the ship in Hawaii, I pick up the bill of lading, I put it in my luggage, and I fly to San Francisco tomorrow, and by the time I get there, I can give it to customs, and by the time you get there, five days later, they've already looked at it. You're like, that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, that, that's how DHL started, right? And that was, that's a complete, you know, completely new business. But it just took somebody not being willing to, you know, be, be hindered by this limitation. Right? It just sort of took somebody saying, huh, that sucks, how do we fix it? Even if it's not your day job. Uh, another great example from the early days of Amazon. So if you, you know, Amazon, it's hard to remember when they only sold books, but even when they only sold books, they didn't actually have books. They were ordering from distributors. So you'd order a book, and they would then order it from Ingram or you know, one of these book distributors who would then ship it and ship it to you. And these distributors, they were all you know, ready for the brick and mortar world, so they all had these weird rules about, you know, well, Amazon, you have to order at least you know, 10 books. 
And so Amazon would be like, oh, that sucks. So, you know, Ken orders a book online. I've got to wait around until there's nine more books that I can order from Ingram and that. But Amazon, if they will only wanted to sell 10% more books, they probably would have been okay with that. Probably would have been cool with that. But Amazon was not cool with that. And they looked for creative ways to, to solve that problem. And somebody at Amazon somewhere noticed that every time they went to order a stack of books, there was this book that was perpetually out of print on lichens. Like, you know, like mossy lichens. And they said, huh, maybe I'll order the book that the customer wants and nine copies of the lichen book, see what happens. And they tried that, and Ingram shipped the book right out with a letter saying, we apologize, we're out of these nine lichen books. And that's actually how they were going to circumvent the system. Uh, I saw an interview with Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I saw an interview with Jeff Bezos where he, he, was, he was saying he's still like paranoid that one day these like, 100,000 copies of the Lichen book are going to show up. Um, but, and, you know, that's, that's growth hacking, right? It's, but it, but it's, it's the mindset behind it more so than the solution, right? Like, that's a pretty clever solution. But what's more interesting is the fact that somebody was just like, I'm not satisfied with that. That sucks. I want to ship books. I don't want to sit around and wait for nine more copies to come in. How do, we, how do we knock down this external limitation? Another thing you could do is you, you bet on trends. So back to Amazon. Think of Amazon in 1995, Amazon in 2015, right? It's just like a whole other scale. So orders and orders of magnitude bigger than businesses. Um, but in that same time period, the internet has grown by 70x, right? The number of internet users has, has exploded. So Amazon did an incredible job, and they grew massively, but they actually kind of strapped themselves to a rocket ship that did a lot of the heavy lifting for them. And so when you're betting on trends that are headed in the direction you want to go, they're like the tailwinds that kind of do a lot of the, the heavy lifting for you. I'll give you an example from Google. So in Gmail, we launched Gmail in 2004, and uh, at the time, <coughs> I think the was it Yahoo Mail, I think, offered four megs of storage. I see my friend Duke over there, and we worked together at Yahoo at the time when they launched Gmail, and Gmail goes out and they promise a gigabyte of storage. A gig, I mean, now a gigabyte, you're like, oh, yeah, whatever, right? I mean, a gigabyte that's like, you know, one image that I just took. But no, I think that was a lot, right? You're just like... Now, I know the team that, that built and shipped Gmail, and I've, and I've heard them tell me this story before. They were scared shitless about that. And the reason is that a gigabyte of storage, like a one gig hard drive in 2004, cost about $1.50. Sounds cheap. But if you're trying to build a product for hundreds of millions of users, or a billion users, that adds up pretty quickly. Um, so they knew it was expensive, but they were betting on something. They were betting on a trend. They knew that the cost of storage would go down. And you know, now it's, a, you know, I think it's actually less than a penny, depending on, you, know, if you, you can't buy a gigabyte drive anymore because you're buying terabytes and terabytes. Um, the price has gone down, the cost has gone down. And that made Gmail uh, a viable business model, right? Because the cost just kept going down. They knew that as, as it grew, that they were betting on this trend. Uh, another really fascinating one is the cost of, of sequencing DNA, sequencing your genome. Uh, it's hard to believe, but in 2001, it cost $100 million to sequence the first, the first genome, genome, $100 million. Um, it's down to about $4,000 today. Um, actually, it's a little bit below that. It's about the cost. Maybe it's actually about the cost of a chest X-ray. It's something that's pretty common. Uh, there's a point at which they totally blew off of Moore's law, where they found a new way of doing it. So it's kind of fascinating to look at that. Uh, and you're like, the price is going to keep going down, right? So okay, well, if you're in the business or in the market where being able to sequence somebody you do know is interesting to you, you know, what will you do when it costs a penny or five cents? And it can be done in seconds instead of weeks. Uh, I was listening to NPR where there's somebody who's talking about this, and he said, "Soon it'll cost less than flushing your toilet." That was kind of a, yeah, interesting price anchor, but um, I, I, I get it though. Right? I, don't, I don't flush the toilet and go, "Oh my God, this is adding up!" Right? You don't, it's just something you don't know. It's, 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 there's no cost to that. So why is it something that costs hundred million dollars and essentially costs nothing? Well, if your business depends on that. What do you do? How do you bet on that? Right, Ride that. Uh, 3D printing. So here's one where we're at kind of this anchor point. I have a 3D printer at home, and it's pretty cool. It takes like 
two hours to print something, and we like my son and I we print before we go to bed, and then we wake up and we find it's all messed up. <laughs> <laughs> like you ran out of you know stuff. You're like ah, oh, you just start over again. And it's cool, right? Because you make something, but it looks you know it looks like it was made on a 3D printer. Um, but come on, right? 20 years from now, you're all gonna have 3D printers in your pocket, right? And you're gonna be like. I can make something for pennies or cents that is higher quality than what I used to have to pay for. So imagine you work for Lego. What does Lego do? We're in the business of selling injection molded plastic and putting it on big container ships and shipping it across the world. Now, if you're at Lego, what do you think about 3D printing? Are you like Kodak and you go, oh, no, that's bad, or, or oh, that's that quality will never be there, or oh, it'll never be as good as our injection molding, oh, it'll never cost as, or do you say, Holy crap, like, there is a point where you're going to be able to make these in your room for pennies, in seconds. Where your kid is going to be like, ah, oh, I can't find that piece. <laughs> you know, you're done, right? Well, that's like, I mean, seriously, right? No, so there's an opportunity there. So that can either be the end of Lego or, holy crap, a whole new opportunity for Lego. Because Lego, they're really not in the plastic injection molding business. They're in the build anything you can imagine business. So what's better than building it for building anything you can imagine than a 3D printer, right? So, so here's this inflection point, uh, and it really comes down to how do you think about the future? How do you think about this trend? Uh, I hope there are people at Lego who, who think this way. I'm sure there are, but the question is whether, whether they will uh, really write it out. Um, so I, I gave this talk before, uh, knowing that there was a bunch of people in the audience who weren't in tech, and so I, I wanted to be careful to talk about trends that have nothing to do with Moore's Law, because I think you could say, ah, well, you know, I work in medicine, or, you know, it's, it's great, technology moves so fast. But here's another example of a trend that has nothing to do at all with technology. This is the average age of the world's population in gray in 2000, if you can't see in the back, yellow is 2050, so 50 year shift. Uh, the world is getting older, because we're living longer. Birth rates are going down. Some countries, it's crazy dramatic. I mean, look at China, 30 to Brazil, 25 to 45. And this is pretty much a certainty, right? I mean, there's just like, you know, you can go to a UN report and you can, you know, download their precise statistical projections for how, what the average age of Brazil is going to be in 2028. Um, well, if you have a business that, that that might be meaningful to, if the world's getting older, what, what does that mean? Like, if you're selling stuff that may be useful to people who are older, how do you bet on the trend? Like, how do you ride this? in a way that's beneficial to what it is you're trying to create. How do you use this as your 10x rocket ship? Um, here's a good example of, of somebody who's done something like this. It has nothing at all to do with technology. It has nothing to do with lab and scientists or tech. This is just some really creative people. Uh, this is called the Intergenerational Learning Center. It's in Seattle. And it is a preschool inside a nursing home. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and they said, okay, well, people are living longer, so nursing home isn't just like the final way station on, you know, the way to death. It's like, you actually may spend a long time there, and you want to have a good quality of life. So you want something meaningful to do. How about a bunch of kids, right? How about helping educate kids? For kids, so if you're, you know, that kid might be six or seven, he's, when he grows up, he's probably going to be taking care of his great-grandparents. We talk, we talk about taking care of our parents or our grandparents. I mean, the people are going to be living longer, so he's going to learn more about the aging process, become more familiar with the aging process. It's just a better quality of life for everyone, right? And there wasn't any scientific breakthroughs, right? There's just a completely different way of thinking about the problem and a completely innovative solution. Uh, and, it's, and it's really, really cool. It's a moonshot that has nothing to do with technology. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to end with this. This is a... If you're familiar with Charles Ray Eames, they're the great, I'm a big mid-century modern design fan. Uh, they're the famous design, Eames Lounge and all that stuff. Uh, they made this movie, this documentary in 1977, I think with IBM, and it's called Powers of Ten. And as you can see, it starts with a lakeside picnic, and it just starts zooming back. And every, I think every 10 seconds, you'll see that they zoom out another power of 10. <coughs> Right, so now you can start to see the countryside, and you know, eventually you'll see the entire <coughs> Earth, and then the solar system, and then the universe. It's pretty cool. And then they get you know, all the way out to the universe, and they zoom all the way back into his hand, and they go to kind of like the subatomic level. Really cool. It's only nine minutes long. Um, definitely encourage you to take a look at it. Um, 
but what I like about it, in addition to helping you grasp what <coughs> orders of magnitude really are like, is the subtitle of this is called The Effect of Adding Another Zero. And what I like about it is it's actually a technique that you can take with you, that you can think about in your day-to-day -day life that'll help you think connect. <coughs> just simple tech, just add zeros to stuff. Right? So if you're, you know, ch again, trying to make the car go 50 miles to the gallon, ask what it would take to go 5,000 miles to the gallon. If you want you know, a, a, bi a million, what would it be if it was a billion? Uh, or what if it cost you know, one cent instead of ten dollars. I mean, you get the, get the idea, right? So adding zeros forces you to think about things in a different way. And, and most of the time, the answer is going to be, that was a really fun exercise, let's get back to business. <laughs> but there's going to be those times where you're like, huh. You know, an engineer on your team or somebody says, you know what, to do that, we'd have to do it this way, but it just might work. Right? That's, where, that's where the 10x thinking comes from. Um, now, important back to the whole thing around measuring impact not effort, put zeros on the impact, not the effort. So, you know, what do I do with a thousand engineers? No, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> 10 more months, no. It's, you know, think about the impact you want to have, add zeros, and it just kind of perks your brain, right? It just forces you to think about things different. It's not like thinking outside the box so much as turning the box around. And the interesting thing, too, that this will do is it will give everyone on your team permission to do the same thing and to have that kind of same thought exercise. Um, and so kind of putting this into practice, think about, you know, just asking this question, just put zeros on it and, and, and ask yourself how you get there. And it's pretty clear that you wouldn't get there by doing it the way you always did, right? You, can, you naturally can't. It forces you to think in this 10x fashion. Okay, so moonshots, not everybody's works at NASA, you're not all trying to land on the moon. Um, but hopefully at least you're, you're somewhat convinced or at least intrigued that moonshot thinking can be for everyone. Um, what I want to show you, this photo is, this is Apollo 11. Uh, this photo is taken on Kodak. I've got a my fact. SO-368 ectochrome film. So, so NASA, the entire space program, every single photo you saw from that era was taken on, on Kodak film. Uh, special lenses that were designed. Uh, pretty cool stuff. But even though the Apollo program ended, moonshots didn't end in 1969. Uh, this pixelated photo is the very best photo we had of the planet Pluto a year ago. And it was taken in, it was like 1996 or something, like the Hubble telescope. It's 100 pixels wide. And, and actually I'm like, I wonder how many people like made tenure from <laughs> just you know, research on this crazy, I mean we, we actually learned a lot from that ridiculous photo. But it seems kind of absurd now that we know this is what Pluto looks like, right? This is from, from the uh, New Horizons project. Um, and just to kind of prove this point, I've given this talk a couple of times and every time I give this talk, I have to update the Pluto photo. Because better ones are out, right? This one just come out like a couple weeks ago. Um, so talk about 10x, right? I mean, this is just a massive, massive advancement. Um, the, the other interesting thing about this photo is when, uh, again, you those were following the New Horizons project started to, to, to unleash some of their photos, they had this uh, NASA digital producer who was doing the interview. And he said, this is our Kodak moment. <laughs> Except Kodak is, is nowhere involved, right? Kodak has nothing to do with that photo. Uh, Kodak's technology, right? Digital photography. The word Kodak moment, but Kodak is, is a distant memory. It's, it's only 45 years. So, 10x, not 10%. That's all I got. Thanks. If you guys haven't seen, he, he, his tagline is, if it's a product manager, always bring the donuts. You know, for the donut Easter egg and everything. Exactly. So, um, yeah, with that, we'll do, we'll do a few minutes of Q&A. So if you have a question, let me know. We'll run the mic to you. And Derek on the, in the turquoise shirt will run it, too. Everyone's stunned. <laughs> Shock and awe. Okay, here we go. Going back to your example about pots and measuring impact, not effort, I, I'm wondering if you can help me think about this a little bit differently, because the way I look at the pots case, if you judge the quality of the pot, you're 
judging impact, but number of pots that like that's effort over time, even if the pot sucks and has no impact on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. You mean the the clay pots, not the pot in the. the <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> um, whole different measure of impact. Here. Uh, no, well, I mean, so that's a really good question, right? Because I think that, that that zooms out from this long-term impact you want to have to what is happening day by day. Well, the impact they wanted to measure was making 100 pots. Um, you know, that was that was what they were they were aiming for. So they were they were aiming for creating creating the perfect pot. Um, I I think the the question there is, you know, what is the north star that you're aiming toward, and then how do you know when you're getting closer to it? So along the way, you're going to be doing small things, you're going to be learning, you're going to be experimenting, but there has to be some anchor that you're moving toward, that you know you're, you're measuring. Uh, at Google, we use a system called OKRs, anybody familiar with objectives and key results? Um, quite simply, what OKRs do is basically once a quarter you say, here's the impact I want to have by the end of the quarter. And I, I'm only going to put a couple things down, because right, we can only do a few things, we can't do too many things, and it's going to be measurable. So I know when I've gotten there, and it's going to be impact I want to have, and and in three months, right? So yeah, in ten years I want to change the world, and reinvent three D printing, but in you know in three months we want to we want to be here. And so how do we measure that? And so how do we make sure every day as we're calibrating that we're making progress toward that big thing we want to do? Um, because you you need to be meandering toward toward a goal. Question. Hi, so you talked about uh, measure impact and not effort. Uh, when you do the 10x, actually, you do get into the situation where you do lot, put a lot of efforts uh, to create the product. So how do you go back to your CEO and explain about that? <coughs> explain about? About a lot of efforts, but no impact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got to have the right CEO. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, th this, this is, you know, this is the question, right? Because if you have a company that is treasuring short-term progress and 10% you know, improvement or quarterly earnings or whatever the like near-term more of the same we do now and up into the right, uh, then that's a very hard argument to make. It's hard to it's hard to convince them of that. Um, you know, I think one thing you need to do, in, and this is I think a problem that we have as PMs. You know, back to impact and efforts, we tend to want to communicate where, why we want to do something in the language of how much work it's going to take, right? So, you know, I'm going to need 10 engineers, and it's like, that's the wrong conversation to have. The conversation is going to be like, where, where will we be if we get there? What will we have discovered? What opportunities will have been created for us if we make it? Um, so, get me excited about this opportunity that you see out there, even if you don't think that it has a huge chance of success, and let's have the conversation around whether you believe that or not, whether you think that's important, or whether I'm excited about it, um, not about you know how much effort you think you need to exert. Um, but again, this is a cultural thing. I mean, if you don't, you know, companies are very companies are very different, uh, and it's hard to create that. And so I would look for opportunities to do it, you know, in the small, in the existing world you have. Uh, you know, even if you're managing a project where you're you're directed to our P and L, I mean, there's still opportunities to try new things and look for interesting. You, you uh, follow? Yeah, follow. So, good, thank you. So the question I have is, when you do the 10x project, how do you figure out an impact? So you know, when you go to the CEO, you need to find out here is a project I would like to do, and here is the impact I believe you want to have some data point around it. But because it's a 10x, it's it's way further away. So how do you figure out the impact, like the number or the data behind it? Uh, what would the world be like if every single person had a camera in their pocket and every time they took a picture they could share it with everyone else in the world, right? I mean, that's that's the that's talking about impact. Hi. Um, it's quite a noisy world now. How do you personally define a trend? Uh, good question. Yeah, I mean, I think I have to believe the data, you know, so there has to be something that, um, I mean, 3D printing I think is a good example because it's probably early enough where there's probably a lot of, you know, maybe some skepticism is built in early. It's like, 
the, the part that makes me believe a trend like that is it's based on other trends that are proven out, right? It's based on Moore's Law, it's based on, you know, costs of materials, it's based on, you know, a lot of stuff that we know, you know, progresses in the right direction. Um, so there has to be something foundational about it that makes you believe it. The hard thing, though, is when you're on an exponential curve, you don't know you're on it until you look back on it. When you look at the internet usage, I, mean, I kind of was a big believer in 96, but it's like, you, know, you look at it now, and it's like even more more so than I thought at the time. But when I looked at the things that were, I was, we were measuring that were getting us excited, it was enough to kind of believe in it. Um, so, you know, I think you need to test it out, you need to experiment. If there's uh, an adoption element to it, you need to prove that out by talking to customers, by experimenting. If there's a technological thing you're betting on, you need to understand the mechanics behind it. Um, you know, the demographic trend, you need to look at the statistics, but you need to convince yourself that it's a trend worth betting on. Uh, and, you know, data will help to support that. We're going to do two more, I think. Yeah, I'm going to stick around. Yeah, yeah Ken will stick around. So here, one here, and then over there, the last one right there. Sure, hi, Ken. Great talk. <coughs> um, I guess the question I have is, uh, you know, I've had, you know, and I've, I've learned some things here today, but I, I've had this sort of conversation about having experiments and trying things um, that are risky. Um, and you know, not necessarily having a fully fleshed out business plan, a project plan that matches it, and knowing exactly when we're going to deliver everything. And when I talk to more traditional uh, kind of uh, business folks, their obviously reaction is very negative, like that's crazy that you would do that. And when I try to use the examples of, of what Google's done, uh, their reaction is, well, Google can do that because they print money through the ads business. Um, no one else could act, do that. How would you respond to that sort of uh, you know, pushback? Um, yeah, I mean, Google is a unique place, and I, I appreciate and understand that from having been there, that it's, that it's unique. Um, but part of what makes Google Google is this constant fear that it's going to stop being Google, right? Everything that the, the founders do is to ensure that we can stay, you know, as, as creative, as innovative as we want. So we're constantly reinventing ourselves, right? We're constantly changing how we build things. So, so it's not like we just kind of became Google and now we get to, to ride it out. Um, you know, I think Larry Page has said that he's most afraid of himself, he's most afraid of Google. The failure that we will co would come would come from ourselves. Um, so it's not you know, we're constantly kind of reinventing it. Um, it's just like dissatisfaction, right? It's just like he's ne you know, never satisfied. They always want something bigger or something better. When you go and you present to Larry and Sergey about something, they start adding zeros to it. And that's what they do. They're like, okay, it's not, you know, what if it was 100 times as big or 100,000 times as fast? Um, there's an old story that I think Astro tells where he, he, he imagines that someday we're going to have finally built a time machine. Right? And he's going to have it working. And he's going to go give Larry Page the demo. And he's going to be like, this is going to blow your mind. And he's going to plug it in. And Larry's going to be like, why is it going to be plugged in? <laughs> because that's just that, that, that kind of mindset. Um, so Google is a crazy, unique place, right? But that doesn't mean that your company, your culture, can't constantly be looking for something bigger and something better and taking that chance. Um, and it's funny you say that because at big companies, you know, I, I talked to some folks from GE, and they're like, oh, we have, you know, our revenues are too big, and our sales are too big. We can't take any risk because we'll screw that up. And to hear you say, oh, well, Google gets lots of money, so they can take, you know, it's just different, different, different mindsets. Um, you know, I think that you have to value, you know, aiming for the moon, right? You have to value the opportunity that you created by doing something that's big and substantial that's never been done before, recognizing um, that it might be a risk. And that, what I'm not telling everybody to do is just, like, throw out everything you're working on and just start because you know, there's a lot of stuff that we do at Google that is that is 10%. There's a lot of stuff we do that's sustainable. There's a lot of stuff that we do um, that is just kind of pushing the ball forward. Um, but you have to find that right balance. You have to make sure you're doing things that are correct. Just maybe, maybe I can ask a, a slight follow-up to this. Like, if, if you were in a company that had existing revenues, how much percent of of the company's business would you dedicate to this moonshot thinking? Um, yeah, I don't know if. I don't know if I have the answer to that. Um, you know, I think I've heard uh, you know 70, 20, 10 as kind of a, a model that I know somebody, some groups have followed. I think Google at one point did, where 70 percent kind of our established core business, 20 percent new kind of forward thinking things, and 10 percent like crazy moonshots. Um, the fear that I have when we start talking about you know what percentage is it necessarily starts with the assumption that there's going to be some people that are working on moonshots and then everyone else is working on the, the core business. 
Um, but really what's most effective is that everybody is thinking you know, across everything is a percentage of their time, right? It's not like the people over there in that building, they work on the cool creative stuff and we just you know, keep the engine running. Uh, you know, that's that that that's the wrong mentality because you're gonna you've got you know ninety percent of the company that's thinks their job sucks compared to the ten percent that are in the building, but also they they don't have that you know mental permission to, to think big and try big. So um, so I'd be cautious of you know it's certainly better to say let's have a percentage of the company thinking big than nobody thinking big. But I think what you really want is everybody feeling like they have permission to connect. And again, it's like even if you know, 99% of what I'm doing is what I expected to be doing, but there's that 1% where we just were like, whoa, this is a completely new opportunity. This is huge. You just blew the doors off. Okay, so, uh, well, thanks, Ken. Uh, one question for uh, 10x product managers. They need certain level of uh, authority or influence, and this is usually tied to budget. Mm -hmm. Any lesson learned of how to design the budget structure or project budgeting structure? Um, well, I would say that you know, authorities for PMs is partially tied to budget, but it's also, you know, it's also tied to, um, you know, respect and admiration of your team, and your peers, and the people who you know who you work for. So as part of it, it's budgetary, um, but part of it is ultimately, you know, do you, can you convince me that you're capable of doing this thing? You and your team are capable of doing this this thing. Um, you know, I. I in terms of the mechanics of budgets, I think when you're, you know, when you're thinking about what you want to do next year, it's going to say, okay, here's what I'm going to ask for, here's what, how big I think my team needs to be, you know, here's how, you know, how, how many people I need and how much money, I, like, try to figure out internally if there's a budget in your head that you can use that will allow for, you know, some percentage of time being done on things that you just can't imagine yet. Um, and it, I'm not saying sandbag, You're like I need 20 people and I really need 18. And <laughs> That's probably not necessarily right, but there has to be some sludge in your head of, you know, we are going to be working, a year from today, I expect to be working on things that I can't imagine today because we don't know they're there. Um, and, and, and what would I need, who would those people be that would help create that? Um, how, how many of them would it take? How, what percentage of our time would it take? What does that mean for our existing business and expectations? Of and that's the hard part. And this is the hard part about it, right? Putting this into practice. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ken. Thanks so much for an awesome talk.